Thank you all very much uh, for reconvening. Thank you for, for being here again just to uh, uh, recapitulate. I'm David Gibson, director of the Center on Religion and Culture, and I'm your co-host together with Campus Ministry for this event, Does Faith Have a Future? Um, we really appreciate, again, our panelists um, from the, the first segment of this symposium, uh, Tara Burton, Ryan Burge, and Kaya Oaks. And now we're going to shift focus to, um, to my friend and former colleague, Alan Cooperman of the Pew Research Center. Um, Alan is an expert on religion's role in U.S. politics and plays a central role in planning the Pew uh, Research Agenda and writing its reports. He's also a longtime friend and uh, colleague from my religion journalism days, which would be the good old days before all the news was fake. <laughs> Alan was a national reporter and editor at the Washington Post and foreign correspondent for the Associated Press among other things. Now, Alan will take us through a presentation of data um, that will help ground many of the observations and questions that we had from the first segment. Alan, you're going to do about 20 minutes or so, then open it up to questions from you for a few minutes. My colleagues, again, as before, will go around with a microphone. Please put your question in the form of a question and uh, ask Alan. Then he will do another 20 minutes or so of the data, and we'll just close out the evening with, with a few more questions. Again, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Alan. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you David. And uh, thank you to my colleagues, the panelists, for being willing to just switch directions on us. And I'm so glad this worked out. You got liquored up. Uh, and softened up, so it's going to be much better. Uh, I'm going to try to walk you through some data on uh, religious disaffiliation or the rise of the nuns, as it were. Um, and I'm going to try to do it as dispassionately as I can. The clicker's not working, but let's see if this goes. So just, you know, I work at the Pew Research Center, and we don't take policy positions. So uh, I will try to speak non Normatively, if I can, in the second part of my presentation, I'll try to get into a little bit about some of the implications or potential consequences of what all this means for American life. Uh, personally, I think it's really interesting. But first, let's just talk about the nuns. And members of the panel did cover some of this. It's not going to be entirely new to you. And you're also reading and literate folks, so I know you know some of this. But I hope there'll be at least a few surprises. Um, I'm also going to share with you some new data. Um, we at the Pew Research Center collect data in a variety of ways. Uh, I would like to think about data as being, um, uh, you know, the, the, the best thing you can do with survey data is to look at the same questions, asking the same kinds of surveys, using the same methods over time, right? That, that, that's really the gold in surveys. And so here, uh, what, what I've done is to take um, more than 10 years now of telephone uh, polls, random digit dialing, uh, nationally representative, very high quality surveys, many, many thousands of respondents. Uh, and we've aggregated some of that data. And uh, the most recent numbers are going to be on the, uh, your far right. So uh, if we start thinking just generally about the religious composition of the United States, so how people identify themselves religiously, which is only obviously one part of what religion is to people, but, but it's an important part. Uh, and we think back to, to 2007. In 2007, 78% of Americans in our telephone polls uh, identified as Christian of one flavor or another. And by 2014, it was 71%. And in a report, uh, I'm sort of foreshadowing some data that's going to come out this very week on Thursday at pewresearch.org. We'll have a new report out with new telephone uh, poll data and the full trend line, all the dots in between uh, 2014 and uh, 2018, 2019 aggregated data. We're now down to 65%. So we've gone from three quarters of the country identifying as Christian of one variety or another to 
uh, 65 or about two-thirds of the country identifying as Christian in one sort or another. And that includes, as the panelists indicated, a decline not just uh, in Protestants but also in Catholics. And I could break this out further. Um, contrary to what some of you might have heard, it includes a decline in percentage terms in evangelical Protestants. So evangelical Protestants are very complicated because if you think of, of evangelical Protestants as a share of the U.S. public, they're going down as a share of the U.S. public. While at the same time they're rising as a share of all Protestants because the main line is in even steeper decline than evangelicalism. Okay? So it depends what your basis is. but. Evangelicals are declining uh, as a percentage of the public. Catholics also going down. Uh, Non-Christian faiths rising a little bit, mostly through immigration, also uh, relatively high um, uh, fertility rates in some groups. So Muslims increasing uh, as a share of the population. Buddhists and Hindus also increasing. Jews pretty stable. Jews at about 2% of the population. Muslims at about 1% of the population today. Uh, altogether, a very, a, a small, from a very small base, a little bit of increase in the non-Christian religions, but the big increase is in the nuns, which over the last decade approximately have risen by 10 percentage points. Uh, just to put this into kind of absolute terms so you have a sense of it, um, with point estimates, can you hear me? I'm walking away from the right in front of you for a second here because I, I, can't, I can't remember all these numbers off the top of my head. But, uh, but basically, in terms of millions, we're talking about Christians having gone from 2009 to 2019, over the past decade, Christians in the United States have gone from something around 178 million to something around 165 million. Bear in mind, the size of the population has increased over that time. So decline in percentage terms and also Christians declining in absolute numbers, okay? not just in percentage terms. Uh, and the nuns increasing in percentage terms and really jumping in absolute numbers from something like 39 million approximately to about 67 million from 2009 to 2019. So that's about a 30 million increase in absolute numbers. So we're now in around 67 million nuns, that is, un people who are unaffiliated, uh, do who don't identify with any religion in the United States. And uh, if this isn't just in Pew data, if we sort of take the long term and we go way back to, to the, in the general social survey done uh, by the National Opinion Research Center, um, um, from 1972, back in the early, you know, in 1972 when the GSS first started asking about religion, nuns were about 5% of the population. It took, if you, th you think about it, sort of put your arms around this, it took basically 20 years to go from 5% to 10%, 10 years to go from 10% to 15%, five years to go from 15% to 20%. And we're now pushing, in the GSS, 23% as of 2018, in Pew data, 26% as of 2019. And something I want you all to realize when you think about polling, don't get too hung up on individual point estimates. If you ask the question in a slightly different way, you do the poll in a slightly different way, you're going to come up with different numbers. If you say to me the nuns are 25%, not 26%, or 23%, or 28%, I'm going to say yes. That's not really important, that exact percentage, because every poll that asks the same question in the same way over time finds the same trend line. The nuns are rising. And that's here, I've sort of showed it to you, in the general social survey, in the American Religious Identification Surveys, in various types of Pew surveys, in Gallup surveys, it, it, it goes on and on and on. Nobody who asks the question consistently over time is finding anything other than that the nuns are rising as a share of the US population. Okay. No. So let's dig into the nuns. All right. First of all, uh, this is broad-based social change. You'll sometimes hear people saying, oh, it's just a coastal thing. Eh, 
Thanks for playing anyway. It's not just a coastal thing. It's happening in all parts of the country. Heard someone ask earlier, what about people of color? Increasing among people of color. It's increasing among all major racial and ethnic groups in the United States. I've heard people say, oh, it's those atheist professors at places like, well, maybe not Fordham, but places that have atheist <laughs> professors. They're brainwashing our young. This is a thing that's happening in colleges, whatever. It's only the educated and you know, lower educated people. No, no, no. Wrong again. The nuns' disaffiliation is taking place among all segments of the population. Not in equal shares, not from the same base, but I'm very hard pressed to find any part of the US population in which this trend is not taking place. This is, again, very broad based social change. The nuns, are they totally secular? Is the word nuns misleading? Yes, the word nuns is misleading. The better term is religiously unaffiliated. Many of the nuns do believe in God. If you put, pull into it, most of them are going to tell you they don't believe in a kind of biblical God. They believe in a higher power, a spiritual force in the universe, but doesn't matter. Many believe in God. Many believe in hell. Even more believe in heaven than believe in hell. And that's true in the general public as well. A th about a third or more pray monthly, right? So they, it is not as though there's no religious pulse in this subset of the population, or as some of the panelists said to you, that many of these folks are spiritual or religious in one way or another. If you dig in in quantitative interviews, virtually everybody has some sorts of beliefs about these sorts of things. Um, and virtually everybody's inconsistent in their beliefs in some level as well, okay? <laughs> But there are a few things to realize about the nuns. First of all, very few of them go to the religious services. So they're not, and that's just one measure, but I can tell you they're not involved in organized religion, mostly. Okay? The second thing is that they are much less religious than the general public. Okay? So they, it's not that, they, that there's no spirituality or religion among the nuns. There is, but they are much less religious than the public as a whole. And if I were to compare them just to people who are religiously affiliated, right, not to the general public of which they're part, right, if I compare them to the a religiously affiliated population, they'd be even less religious looking. And I'm just showing you some standard measures. We could go through all the different measures that we have, and there are dozens of them, and you'd see the same basic patterns. Uh, what about? You know, what about spiritual but not religious? Aren't the spiritual but not religious rising? Yeah, the number of Americans who say they're spiritual but not religious is rising. Do you know why? Because the number who say that they're religious is declining. There's not actually a rise in the share who describe themselves as spiritual. There's a decline in the share who describe themselves as religious. Now, most people who are religiously affiliated, who identify with a religious tradition of any sort, most of them describe themselves as both spiritual and religious. A plurality of those who don't identify with any religion describe themselves as neither spiritual nor religious. That's only self-description. Spirituality is a really tough thing to measure. It's sort of in the eye of the beholder. I'll just tell you, Basically, as far as the measures that we've got, they're not perfect. Maybe we're measuring the wrong things. Got to be the first to admit that. But if you look at things like, uh, do you believe in spiritual energy and physical objects like mountains, rivers, and crystals? Do you believe in reincarnation? Do you believe in astrology? Do you believe in psychics? Do you believe in fate? These sorts of, sort of basic spiritual questions. People who are religiously unaffiliated, yes, many of them believe those things, but not at higher rates than those who are religiously affiliated, at equal or in some cases lower rates. In other words, the idea that, that disaffiliation, that, that the unaffiliated are equally religious but religious in different ways, that they're spiritual in somehow different ways, and that that's replacement 
I don't see any evidence for it. Now again, maybe I'm not measuring the right things. There are lots of new ideas about ways of measuring spirituality and what spirituality might be. And there's some people who want to say, you know, if you see a beautiful sunset and it, and it moves you, are you spiritual? We've never measured that before. I don't know whether that's actually on the rise or not. So I'm going to admit, got to admit, incomplete um, picture here, but I don't see evidence in the data that disaffiliation is accompanied by a, a real rise in spirituality, right? Like the people who are unaffiliated are not more spiritual in any discernible way than the people who are affiliated. In fact, spirituality tends to be higher among people who are conventionally religious. Did, it, did that make sense? Yes. Okay. Uh, so another thing that's going on that's really, really interesting. So the, the nuns, the unaffiliated, they do have a religious pulse. Over time, though, what's happening? Over time, they're becoming less religious, not more religious. So we can see this especially in two massive surveys we did in 2007 and 2014, the religious landscape surveys, each with 35,000 respondents all across the country, US adults, very high quality, very, very uh, good surveys. And you'll see, for example, that the share of the unaffiliated who say that religion is somewhat or very important in their lives dropped between those two surveys from 41% to 34%. And the share who said it's not too or not at all important rose from 57 to 65%. And the same things with frequency of prayer, or religious attendance, and belief in God. All these things are actually declining over time among the nuns. So the nuns are growing, and they're becoming, if anything, less religious over time. Now, if you look at the entire US public, all US adults all at once, and you look at a bunch of standard things, again, I'm going to go back to this. May not be the perfect measures. You may not like the way we or others phrase them. But you ask the same questions in the same kinds of surveys. Over time, you get a valid trend. You can sort of sense what's going on. And especially if you start looking at multiple measures, you get a sense. All these basic things little bit of decline. Not huge decline, but little bit of decline in the US public as a whole. So the share of Americans who say they pray daily is down. The share of Americans who say they believe scripture is the word of God is down. The share who say they attend religious services on a regular basis is down, and so on. And by the way, these are only 2007 to 2014 data. As I said, we're going to have some more data later this week. These trends are basically continuing as so far as we can see. And once again, I'll also tell you the point estimates, the share who say this, the share who say that, may be different in one set of polls from a different set of polls, but you're going to find the same trend. So if you looked at general social survey data or American national election survey data or any other set of data, forget about Pew data. If you don't believe Pew data, fine. Look at somebody else's data. You're going to find the same basic trend lines. OK, now, here's what's also interesting. So in the general public, declines. What if we focus just on the people who continue to identify with a religious tradition? Just the people who identify as Catholic, or as some kind of Protestant, or as Jewish, Jewish, or Buddhist, or atheist, or, agnostic, or flying spaghetti meatball. Doesn't matter. They identify with some religious tradition. We take all of them. We look just at that group. Well, that's really interesting because that group is not declining very much, if at all, in its beliefs and practices. In other words, you have a lot of stability among the portion of the American public that still identifies with religion, while you've got a growing share of the public that does not identify with any religion. That group is becoming less religious, and that is what's driving the overall decline, apparent decline, in religiosity in the American public. Got it? Questions? Confusing anybody? OK. All right. Why is this happening? This is what David asked me to try to get to. This is hard stuff. I'll do my best. First, I think I can nail two proximate causes. These are not the deep-rooted causes, but two quick things that I think we can see are going on. The first is that there are strong generational patterns in this. So 
if you just look at the share of, the, of people in each generation who are nuns, it's rising by generation. And you know what? If you say to me, Alan, what's really the difference between Gen X and boomers? What about the late Gen X? I'm the first to admit, these generational names and things, there's no rocket science there. There's not really, you know, uh, they don't really, it, it isn't really true that baby boomers all have a certain something in common that Generation X doesn't. Order. So forget, if you didn't do this, if you did it by 10 year birth cohorts, like people born in 1960, people born between 60 and 1970, people between, born between 1970 and 1980, 1980, 1990, or so on, or you did it 1965 to 1975, 1975 to 90, you'd find the same patterns. Okay? It's not an artifact of the definitions of the generations. So in that sense, I'm calling it generational, but don't get lost in, oh, it's a millennials versus boomers thing. What we're saying is younger generations are less religiously affiliated than older generations, all right? And we're gonna unpack that a little bit more. They're also less religious by all the standard markers of religiosity, less likely to pray daily, less likely to attend religious services, less likely to say religion's important in their lives. And here's a fabulous slide. I love this slide. Please, please pay attention. Ryan did allude to this earlier, I think, Ryan Birch. This is from the General Social Survey, and here I've mapped out each generation by itself, color-coded over time, and marked the share of that generation that is religiously unaffiliated. So we start down at the bottom with the greatest generation, my parents' generation, fought the world, Second World War. When that generation, we first picked that generation up in surveys in the early 1970s, 3% are unaffiliated. As of the early aughts in the general social survey, 7% are unaffiliated. Silent generation, generation that came of age right after the Second World War. 6% when they were young adults, 10% by the early uh, tens. Baby boomers, my generation, started at 13% as of the early tens. What do you call it, tens? I don't even know. Except early aughts, but the 2010s, whatever it is. But we're talking about 2014, 2015, 2016 data here, 15%. Generation X and millennials. So what's the pattern here? One, it's two, two things you can glean from this slide. Each recent generation is less affiliated or more unaffiliated than the prior generation. That's one, that's obvious, right? But there's something else. No generation, as it's getting older, is becoming more affiliated. So somebody asked, and Ryan talked a little bit about life cycle effects, right? The sense that as we get older, as we go through our lives, we have children, get married, have more children, <laughs> we get sick, our knees go bad, we start thinking about death. Many of us become more religious. You've seen that in others, you may have seen that in yourselves, your intuition is not wrong about that. There, I could show you other charts that will show in various ways that as the event generations have gotten older, they've tended to pray more, they've tended to say religion's more important in their lives. It's particularly true of the boomer generation, but not only the boomer generation. There are these life cycle effects, but, but recent, no recent generation has become more religiously affiliated as it's gotten older. In other words, if your priest or minister says, yeah, they're nuns, yeah, they're unaffiliated, but it's because they're young people, and when they get older and they have kids, and they start thinking about they're gonna come back, I know they're gonna come back. Well, I can't say he or she is wrong because I don't have a crystal ball, I can't tell, but I can tell you that the past pattern has been that no, on the whole, they don't. Now, certainly some do, because right, these are large numbers. These are, the, each of these lines represents many, many, many thousands of people. So there are individuals who come back, but there are also others who leave. No recent generation, I'll just repeat it, no recent generation has become more religiously affiliated as they have gotten older, and each religious, each generation has started out 
less affiliated than the previous generation. So in other words, a lot of what's going on here is generational change. That doesn't tell you really why, but the pattern is generational. Generational change isn't the entire thing because there's also movement away within generations. The other thing that's going on is what I'll call religious switching, and you may want to think of it as conversion, but I use the term switching because I'm thinking of people coming and going and from all religious groups all at once. We have a very, very dynamic religious marketplace in the United States. Lots of people switching. And something to, to think about here. One way of, one way of doing it in surveys, we ask people, in what religion were you raised? We also ask them separately elsewhere in the survey, what's your religion today? And we can put those two things together. And you can see the share of people in each religious group who were raised in that religious group who are still in that group. So what share of people who were raised as Catholics are still Catholics? And overall in the United States, 59% of people who were raised, tell us they were raised as Catholics, are still Catholic. So a couple of things to notice here. First of all, the unaffiliated have what is, in comparative terms, a lousy retention rate. <laughs> It's not the Hotel California. You can check out. <laughs> Lots of people who were raised as unaffiliated go on to take a religion. In fact, almost half of the people who tell us in surveys overall that they were raised with, with no religion have gone on to take a religion. However, there are many more people raised with religions. And the overall ratios are very much in favor of the unaffiliated. So overall, you have 4.2 people who have, uh, 4.2 US adults who've gone from being raised in a religion to being unaffiliated for every person who's gone from being affiliated, I'm sorry, unaffiliated to now identifying with a religion. Okay, so you got the ratio is 4.2. You've got 4.2 people who've gone from being religiously affiliated, from being raised in a religion. They were raised as Catholic, they were raised as Protestant, they were raised as Jewish, and now today they're nuns. You got 4.2 of those for every person who was raised as a nun and has gone on to become Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu, Wiccan, what have you. Right, so you've got much more movement. You've got, they have a lousy retention rate, but the numbers are much bigger to begin with of the affiliated. Okay? Now, the biggest net losers, and it'll be interesting for this, because through religious switching are Catholics. In the United States, you have 6.5 people who've left Catholicism, 6.5 people who were raised as Catholics who no longer identify as Catholic for every one person who was not raised as Catholic and has converted to become a Catholic in the United States today, overall. Uh, evangelicals actually have a little bit of net gain through religious switching. You'll notice they have more people coming in than leaving. They do, though, still have the generational issue, right? That the younger generations are less affiliated than the older generations. And that's why evangelicals are still losing, declining as a share of the population, while again increasing as a share of all Protestants. All right. Uh, I'm going to go back and leave it there for a second. Let's take some questions, and then I'll talk about some of maybe the theories about the deeper rooted reasons why, why, why this is, is going on. There were some great questions earlier. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, just your, I'm not a statistician or a mythologist, no. but what's your uh, sample? How many? Oh, sure. Uh, I'm mixing a lot of different data here. It comes from different surveys. Um, all of the surveys that we do at the Pew Research Center are probability surveys. Uh, of the uh, U.S. adult public is everything that I've shown here. Uh, mostly for the sake of consistency, uh, I've been showing you data that comes from random digit dial telephone surveys done by landlines and cell phones. The surveys are nationally representative and they're weighted to be representative of the U.S. public. So the numbers, how many? Yeah, well, the two religious landscape surveys that, that, um, that I showed in 2007 and 2014, th those were 35,000 each 
Those are very large samples. The, um, the, the initial numbers that I showed you that are, that, that are aggregated uh, polling, those would be tens of thousands for aggregated polling. That's multiple surveys in which we've asked the same question in, in the latest numbers, the 2018-2019 data. And the figures that we're going to come out with in um, later this week uh, that'll fill in some of the dots in between uh, are uh, our aggregated uh, telephone polls from uh, each year for recent years. So there's 10,000 plus people well over 10,000 represented in each of those dots. But any one particular survey, typically our, our national political surveys are around 1,500 uh, people. And again, they're weighted to be represented, so they're representative, they, they're, they're representative of the public in terms of age, gender, education, income, race, ethnicity, region, urbanicity, and, and, and so on. And we should, we should have some more conversation about why, you, why trust or not trust polls, and I'll be glad to get more into the methods, but let's have a that's, few more that's questions. That's exactly what I would like you okay. to do, is get more into that. There are a number of New Yorkers, myself among them, who went to bed on election night being told by all the polls that Hillary Clinton was going to be our next president. And the national polls and the national polls were exactly right. Our last poll showed Hillary Clinton up by two percentage points nationally. And what did Hillary Clinton do in the national vote? She was up by two percentage points. Our polls are not representative of the Electoral College, and they're not state-level polls. Be, beyond that, there's there there is there's a, an unfortunate. Uh, I understand it, but it's unfortunate that the credibility of polls in the U.S. public's mind has for decades been tied to their ability to predict elections. And you realize that in predicting an election, you're really trying to do two things. You're asking a poll to do two things. One, to tell you what the population is thinking at the time the poll's taken. And two, you're then asking the poll to predict the behavior of people. Which of those people will actually turn out and, and, and vote? And pollsters come up with things we call likely voter um, models that attempt to take a variety of data about whether people say that they really are registered and whether they really, really intend to vote and so on, and tend to then try to predict what share of the people who say that they support Hillary, and what share who say they support Donald are actually going to come to the polls. But that, that's not what roles are really good at. That's predicting behavior. Okay? Now, telephone polls, all of you, has anybody in this audience ever refused to take a telephone call from someone you didn't know or hung up on a pollster? <laughs> Shame on you. But so have I. Okay. Now, the thing to realize, a couple of things. Uh, have any of you actually ever taken a poll? Ah. So many of you might turn down a pollster. Maybe you turn down a pollster six out of seven times. But maybe on the right day, in the right moment, you do answer a poll. Now, the thing is, polls are weighted. So we get, when we do random digit dialing, if you're talking about telephone polls, do you call a lot of people around the country, cell phones as well as landlines, get people to answer, ask them questions, and you also know their demographics. So if in that poll you happen to have more men than women, or more younger people than older people, or more people of color than white people, or whatever, and it's not quite right, you can wait. You weight up the ones that you have to, you weight down the ones you have too many of, you weight up the ones you have, and then you look at the data when it's, once it's weighted. This is stand, standard practice of polls. So once, so, so the question really isn't, are you, the people who answer polls or don't, differ from the ones who do? The question you should think is, are you so different systematically from people who are just like you demographically? So, is what you would tell a pollster, or maybe you wouldn't pick up the phone, but the person who is like you, your age, your gender, your level of education, your region of the country, your income, so on and so forth, so different from the person who did answer. And that systematically, yes, there are a few things that stand out. People who do answer polls 
are systematically more civically participatory. They're more likely to be registered to vote and they're more likely to volunteer. But other than that, in terms of political behaviors and in terms of many other things, they're not so different. And as a result, even with relatively low response rates, telephone polls still generate quite accurate data. Now, how do we know that, okay? Is it just that we know that because we can predict an election? No. We've got lots of government data that tells us what the correct answer is on various things. What share of the public smokes? What share of black people smoke? What share of white people? What share of young people? What share of old people? What people is share of people in the South? What share of people in the West? So on, smoke. What share of driver's licenses? What share do this? What share do that? There's tons of very good government data from the census, bureau surveys, et cetera. We can ask those questions in surveys, look at the weighted data, and see how well we've done, not only for the general public, but for subsets of the general public. And frankly, it's much harder to get the subsets right. It's much harder to get Asians or Hispanics or African Americans right than it is to get the general public right. We publish this stuff, and generally speaking, the random digit dial of surveys are still generating um, good data. However, I'll also tell you that the Pew Research Center is almost, as many other pollsters, almost done with telephone polls. We probably aren't going to do them in the future. And there are only two ways to frame a survey in the United States of the general public. To frame the universe from which you're drawing a sample. Telephones, because almost everybody has a telephone, or addresses. There's a Postal Service master address list of all the residential addresses in the United States. And like telephone numbers, it's constantly in flux but it's good enough and stable enough that you can draw a sample from it. And so increasingly, the way we reach people is by addresses. We send them letters. We ask them to then go online and answer surveys. You can't, there's no way to frame a probability survey on people's internet addresses or email addresses, because there's no universe in that. More questions? All right, all right, let me uh, move on to, um, some of the theories about, and I'm going, to, you, you, I'm going to break it into four, four theories about the deeper roots of disaffiliation in the United States or the decline of institutional religion, the rise of the nuns, whichever terms you like. Uh, the first is politics. This clearly is Professor Burge's uh, theory. Um, it's known in the trade as the Hout-Fisher hypothesis. Um, Michael Hout and Claude Fisher, um, excellent sociologists of religion, wrote a seminal paper along these lines. And as Professor Bird suggested, the data is pretty clear. There are big differences in terms of partisanship and uh, political views between people who are religiously unaffiliated and people who are affiliated. The unaffiliated are more liberal, more democratic and more liberal. You also note that in terms of timing, that when did the rise of the nuns begin? Well, it began in the late 80s around the same time, or yeah, mid, mid to late 80s, around the same time as the rise of the moral majority, sometimes the religious right, et cetera. Um, uh, Mike Hout and Claude Fisher and others suggest that this is not just a coincidence. Uh, their theory basically is that the rise of the nuns is in large part a political backlash, a backlash against the entanglement of religion and politics, and particularly of organized American Christianity with conservative American politics. And Professor Birch, I think, made a good uh, case for that earlier. Um, uh, you can see, um, if you look at the affiliated versus the unaffiliated on a number of these measures, um, in particular, for example, if you ask, are religious uh, churches and other religious organizations too involved with politics? Two thirds of the unaffiliated say yes, 40% of the affiliated say yes. So the unaffiliated, to some extent, are, are turned off by the entanglement of religion and politics. So that's theory number one. I'm going to just move quickly through this. Theory number two, we had a, someone asked earlier about natality. Feeds into that, very, very much a related thing. Marriage, as you may know, is in decline in the United States. And marriage is not so much in decline because divorce is rising. Actually, divorce hasn't risen very much. What's really risen is the share of people who are never married. People are getting married later and later, and larger and larger numbers are never getting married. So uh, the share of American adults who are married has dropped from 72% in 1960 to just a hair under 50% 
uh, in 2015. Okay? Less than half of American adults are married today. And you'll notice the share who are divorced has increased, but it hasn't increased that dramatically. It's the big yellow blob at the top, the never married, that's gone from 15% to 30% of American adults. Well, what happens if you're never married? Well, yes, indeed, many people who are not married do have kids, as I alluded to earlier, sort of jokingly. Um, but uh, on the whole, marriage, child rearing, et cetera, uh, are related. And I think as a practical matter, we have this sense, and I get into the data, but you have a sense that families and religion are sort of tied together. Um, religion is a way of marking things. Many people want to pass on religion to their children. Um, I certainly can't be the only one who knows people who were never seen to be Jewish until their kids came to be of age to be bar mitzvah, and then suddenly, you know, it, it happened. Um, in my circle of friends, I certainly see that, um, and I think you all probably experienced some version of that in your own lives. So, I have a sense of that. So, the, the second theory, and this actually Robert Wuthnow at Princeton has written a good deal about this, is basically this notion that as religion, I'm sorry, as marriage has declined, um, um, and actually as fertility rates in the United States have declined, uh, that, um, that, that that has something to do with, with disaffiliation. Exactly how, exactly is a little bit muddy, um, uh, uh, but, but that's, the, that's the basic theory. Um, by the way, intermarriage is also rising. And a lot of intermarriage is not between people who have two different religions, but between someone who has a religion and someone who doesn't have a religion. And an interesting thing in the data is how often it's the woman who does have a religion and the man who doesn't. That's the more predominant um, pattern. Uh, OK, uh, last, bowling. And again, Professor Birch stole my thunder on this, but it's, that's OK, it's OK. It's Robert Wuthnow's, I'm sorry, not Robert Wuthnow's, so it's Robert Putnam at Harvard's um, wonderful book, uh, Bowling Alone. And here the theory is, or, or, or the way to think of it, one way to think of it is, he's saying, folks, wait a minute. Maybe this isn't just about religion. Maybe religion is a symptom here of a broader social change. So this is a graph from the book showing the share of Americans who bowl in bowling leagues. And it went from nothing in 1900, because bowling alleys basically didn't exist, to up to 80% of American adults who were in bowling leagues in, as of the 1950s and early 60s, and then just plummeted right down. And the other thing that he shows is that bowling alleys were still busy in the 1970s and 80s. People were still bowling. They just weren't bowling in leagues. The organized leagues went through. And, and it wasn't just bowling leagues that fell apart. When was the last time you went to an Elks Club dinner? or any type of fraternal organization dinner. This is from a 2019 um, a newspaper article in the Zanesville, Ohio Times Recorder about tr people trying to get rid of the old B uh, Elks Lodge, BPOE Lodge in Zanesville. All around the country, this is happening. So the idea is this. Wait a minute. What if what's happening here is not just religion in decline. Maybe what's happening here is a broader decline in civic participation. Maybe we're living more atomized lives. So atomized. Uh, a woman used to be a woman. Maybe it's anybody. Did it have a, a, a flacon of, of uh, perfume? And it has a little bulb, the old old-fashioned bulb. And you squeeze the bulb. And out, the, the liquid comes out in a spray of a thousand tiny droplets. And what's that device called? Atomizer. An atomizer, right? So it's taken the liquid and it's broken it up into a thousand tiny individual particles. And the idea here is we are living increasingly atomized lives. Perhaps you bring the internet into this, or social media, or mobile devices if you want. Perhaps. Um, um, allowed or encouraged by these things to feel self-sufficient, to feel individual, uh, and bring marriage back in. And we're less, we're less likely to be married, um, um, uh, et cetera. And so religion is just part of the picture. And then there's a fourth theory. And the fourth theory says, wait a minute. Maybe not only is it not just religion, maybe it's not even just the United States. Maybe this is a global 
relationship between what we broadly think of as affluence, or maybe it's what some people call affluenza, right? <laughs> affluence and influenza, if you see this as a bad thing, which, by the way, I, I'm not necessarily stumping that this is a bad thing. But here, here we've done surveys of religion uh, in 98 countries around the world, most of them more than once. And on this chart, um, scatterplot chart on the x-axis, uh, I've plotted GDP uh, per capita. And on the y-axis, the share of adults in each country who say religion's important in their lives. So a kind of basic marker of how religious the countries are. And you see a very clear overall pattern. It's very simple to say in a few words. The richer a country, the less religious it tends to be. The poorer a country, the more religious it tends to be. And there are two big outliers. What are the two outliers? The US is one. Why? Rich and religious. But there's an outlier and there's another outlier. What's the other one? China. China is way down here. No, poor and non-religious. Yeah. China is relatively poor and non-religious. The United States is relatively rich. Now, by the way, if we had data from Saudi Arabia where we're not able to do surveys of religion, uh, it, Saudi Arabia would be up there. Kuwait would be up there. The United States is not the only outlier, and China might not be the only outlier either. Uh, but the basic theory here is a variety of theories. It used to go by the name of secularization theory. There's sort of more updated versions of secularization theory today. Probably the one you want to know about is uh, it goes, uh, it's, 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 its best known academic proponents are uh, Ronald Englehart and Pippa Norris. And it, it goes under the moniker of um, Existential insecurity. So the idea is that when people are existentially insecure, when they fear for their lives, or maybe they don't actually fear for their lives, but they feel insecure, maybe at a unconscious level, uh, maybe because there are a lot of guns around, uh, maybe because they have no social safety net, um, um, maybe because they live in societies that are politically in turmoil, uh, that religion is more needed in their lives. And places that are with greater existential security, religion's less needed in their lives. And uh, this is what uh, the proponents uh, of this theory argue explains the United States. Because they'll say the United States is relatively rich, but we still have a lot of existential insecurity. By comparison with places like Western Europe, uh, where the social safety net uh, is stronger. Again, I, I'm not actually, I'm, please don't take this way and say, I told you this is the case. I'm just trying to explain the basic theories. Now, last and maybe most important thing I want to say about this, and before I turn it over for questions, is that the, I didn't think in, beyond the question of what's going on here, what's the deeper causes of disaffiliation, is the question of, well, what are the consequences? And is this a bad thing or a good thing? <clears throat> and clearly, if you belong to a religious tradition and you believe in the values and the truth claims of that religious tradition, then you may see decline of religion as a negative thing. And by the same context, uh, if you're an atheist uh, or, or um, a strongly secular person and, and have a principled commitment to that, you might see the decline of religion as a good thing. Um, but I would like to raise for you the possibility that uh, leaving those two points of view aside, um, how we could think of this in social terms. Um, and, uh, and here I would say that whether this is, whether th uh, uh, the rise of the nuns and the decline of institutional religion is a really terrible thing or maybe an OK, fine thing, or maybe a really great thing for society depends a lot on what you think is the cause. Because if you think that the cause is political and or scandals in churches, it's younger people turning away from what they see as hypocrisy. It's ministers not walking the walk. It's the kinds of things that you talked about with the panel. If you think it's those sorts of things, then maybe the decline of institutional religion is justified. In a competitive world, it's a wake-up call. Maybe religious institutions can and should do better. And maybe if they can and should do better, future generations will come back. You know, in that sense, if that's the cause, it isn't necessarily a terrible thing for society, right? It could be that it's just time for change. But 
if you think that the cause is not that, if you disagree with Professor Burge and you don't think, oh, this is just about politics, this is just, this is because Christianity has gone conservative, young people don't like it, they see it as hypocritical, plus there's all that scandal stuff. If you don't think it's that, you think it's, oh, wait a minute, that Putnam guy, that bowling alone thing here, that makes a lot of sense to me. I'm afraid that there's a broad decline in civic participation in our country. By the way, from what I read, and I don't, this is not data that I collect, volunteering is down. Giving is down in the United States. At first, those things started trending down during the Great Recession. People thought it was because of the Great Recession. Now I'm reading more and more in the academic literature suggesting those things have continued down. Now, not overall giving because rich people are giving more, but middle class giving is down and middle class volunteering is down, at least according to some of the things I read. Think about that. Maybe, again, this isn't just about religion. So if this is a broader, if you believe in the atomizer thing, if this is our whole society is becoming more atomized, we're living more and more individualistic lives, and religion is just a symptom of that change, then maybe that's not such a great thing. And furthermore, how do we get out of it? It's not like it's just a matter of hypocrisy and politics. It's like, how do we reverse that? How do we, how do we put this genie back in the bottle? Right? I leave you with that. Thank you very much. <laughs>
sort of even unconsciously as to how people experience themselves in the universe and, and notions about God. Yeah. Can I ask one, yes, question, David. one fine grain question? Yes. You raised one point about mixed marriages. Yes. Between unaffiliated and yes. affiliated woman was more likely to build. What happens to those marriages? Yes. Where, where, who, which has the greater propensity to last? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Or, or also, where do they go? Do they go towards affiliation? Do they bring the spouse towards affiliation? Or do they bring the affiliated spouse towards unaffiliation? So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure that I can 100% answer it. I can tell you that there's a, there's a correlation in the data um, that um, marriage to someone of the same faith is associated with a bump up in religiosity. Um, however, think about chicken and egg. That is, someone who marries someone of a different faith, maybe their religion wasn't that important to begin with. So I can't, even if I can see an association that people who marry someone of the same faith tend to be more religious than people who marry someone of a different faith, I don't actually know that that's, I don't have any way to put a, um, a control on that to, to know that that's the, re I'd have to do longitudinal study and follow people. But there, there is some really interesting work on intergenerational transmission of religion and intermarriage and what's going on. And I'll tell you that the, the laboratory for this, the natural laboratory, is the Western United States, which is the least religious part of the country. The Western United States is the least religious part of the country and also has the highest rates not only of religious intermarriage, but also of ethnic and racial intermarriage. And so the US Census Bureau does not ask any questions about the, the religion of individual Americans. That's why I'm here talking to you, right? If, if the Census Bureau did it, I wouldn't be here. But all the data comes from private polls because the Census Bureau does not ask about religion. But the Census Bureau asks about race and ethnicity. So we've got great data on racial and ethnic intermarriage, which has been rising very rapidly now. And newer marriages in the United States, there's much more crossing even, and I, look, the racial designations are all, to use a technical term, fakakta. <laughs> You're all New Yorkers, even Catholic New Yorkers, you should get. But, but you know, but, but even using this, just the, stand, the Census Bureau standard categories, it's increasing. But Religious intermarriage also seems to be increasing, and, um, and it is going hand in hand with declining religiosity in the general public, but I don't know what's cause and what's effect. That's, that's what I'm trying to say in a nutshell. We're going to have to wrap it up there, folks. Thank you for joining us.